What if everything you've been told about Africa is wrong? Or at best, completely one sided? What if the stories of hopelessness you've heard were only a few among the many more of hope, success, progress, and prosperity? Our guest on this episode of the League of Visionaries podcast will invite you to discover the African continent through the fresh eyes of new narratives. She has dedicated her life and career to the advancement of the African continent. As founder of the Access Africa channel, she has reached international audiences through her series on CNBC Africa and other international platforms. Her current project takes on the courageous topic, Africa, on the cusp of an economic miracle. Yelang Prujinka is the founder of the Access Africa channel, a consultant, executive producer, speaker, and author. Her visionary message is that new stories and the facts behind them can show us how Africa is poised to lead the way worldwide. Welcome to the League of Visionaries podcast by Yazi Media. The League of Visionaries podcast is your place to meet visionaries, professionals, entrepreneurs, and other thought leaders with a visionary message to share. This podcast is for you if you too are a visionary driven by a deeper purpose in your work, your play, and your investments. I'm your host, Marie-Therese LaRue, the media strategist with soul and founder and owner of Yazi Media Virtual Media House. Connect with this League of Visionaries as we explore the power of purpose and how to bring it to the world through your message. This season of the League of Visionaries podcast is brought to you by Totally Morpheus, creators of the Egg 3 Leadership Assessment. It's fast, it's fun, it's free, and it points the way to your living leadership legacy. Take the Egg 3 Leadership Assessment now at totallymorpheus.com. Elang, what a pleasure having you with us today on the League of Visionaries podcast to share your visionary message. My visionary message is that Africa is indeed one of the leading continents in terms of her resources, her people, and where the continent is headed. I believe that in the next century, the focus will firmly be put on Africa. And even the challenges that exist in Africa are opportunities for us to find solutions to those challenges. And therein, those challenges themselves are industries, you know. And so my visionary message is that for anybody who's looking to do business, for anybody who's looking to find growth, Africa is the place to look. Africa is the place to be. This is so incredibly exciting. And I love the fact that you are standing with a message that seems very, very brave in the light of many of the challenges that Africa faces at the moment. And um, I, I'd love us, as we continue our conversation, to dive a little bit deeper into why our exact challenges may be the key to those precise things that helps Africa to leapfrog the so-called developed world so that we can actually guide the way for the rest of the world. But I'd love to ask you, uh, Ilang, how did you discover that this is your message? So I guess at the age of seven, my dad and I were having a conversation and my dad was an ambassador. So we were stationed in Russia. We, he, he was the ambassador of Cameroon to Russia and we were having a conversation. And because I hadn't traveled the African continent, although I was a young African child, he asked me what country I would love to visit or live in or be. And for whatever reason, I said South Africa. I mean, for a seven-year-old, <laughs> some 30-odd <laughs> years ago, that was a very strange answer. But as my life evolved, I realized that it wasn't strange at all. It was actually a calling. At the time, South Africa was, even in our passports, it had, you could travel to all countries except South Africa. And that was everybody's passport. I mean, globally, that was what it was said in the passport. So perhaps the fact that globally one couldn't travel to South Africa <laughs> piqued my interest to say, you know, forbidden that. fruit is always <laughs> sweeter. <laughs> Absolutely. And at seven, to even have that concept is, is beyond me. 
But yes, so that is where it all started. But over and above that, in my youth, I would always hear Africa being spoken of and about from authority figures who were not African. You know, so I would watch CNN and it was always these white men talking about a continent that I I come from and belong to. And I thought, well, that's not right because, you know, what gives them the authority and why is it that they are shaping the narrative? <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> I guess that's always my leading trait. And in the face of that, I thought, okay, let me look for voices that, aren't these voices and there weren't many back then i'm so grateful that more and more people are looking to the continent and engaging with the continent especially younger people that mm. warms my heart in a big way because you know the more people do that and with the advent of technology that really levels the the, the playing field because we now understand that a lot of what has been said about africa is just not true you know, so there have been many inaccuracies and the lens through which this continent has been portrayed has not really favored the continent nor her people. And so mm. that is something that is something that I'm very passionate about. I always <laughs> make a joke and I tell people, it doesn't matter how bad our roads are, it can never get as bad as the road from LaGuardia in New York, from their airport into New York. It can, can never get that bad. So if you're looking at it from that perspective, how come no one ever talks about that? But we're always talking about how underdeveloped Africa is. And Africa really is not that underdeveloped. And the research is there to prove it. That is just incredible. And what a way to have framed your experience as a child from Africa who was growing up outside and up in Russia. And that must have been still really some pretty intense times when you had this literally a calling. That's incredible. You have found really fascinating and powerful and courageous ways to share this visionary message in the work that you do. You are a speaker. You are also a voice for Africa through your Access Africa channel and the work that you do there. And then, of course, you've been writing. Tell us about all of these wonderful things in the order that they come to you, because there's just so much. Where do I begin and what have I left out? <laughs> you've really concisely put me out there. Where we begin is with Access Africa Channel. Now, Access Africa Channel is a media concern that focuses on creating business stories that get shared on whatever platform we have been in on CNBC Africa. We have been on various African networks that pick up our offerings. Uh, the business stories are told in what is now considered long form. So you're looking at about mm. 12 to 13 minutes where we spotlight an African country and doing business in that African country. We go to the country and we interview the relevant people. We showcase the actual country itself so that the business viewer gets a personal view of what it is to be in that country. So that's Access Africa Channel. We have been very blessed to have had three seasons of the show. Our wow. first season, we were commissioned by Tiger Brands to tell the Tiger Brands expansion story focusing on fast-moving consumer goods. The second season saw us collaborating with the Nordic nations. So we had this wonderful exchange with the, with the Nordics. You're talking about Finland, Norway, Sweden, mm -hmm. and how they do business with Africa, which has a very long-term view. They do business, they're in it for the long haul. And especially with the sorts of disciplines that they are in, they're more in your energy, your education, things that take time. And so that's how they do business with Africa. And then our third and um, final season before COVID hit saw us taking brand South Africa onto the continent. So we looked at all the, the businesses from South Africa that are doing great on the balance of the continent. So we, we looked at your Mr. Price, we looked at your MTN, we looked at your Sun Internationals, all these businesses that come out of South Africa but have a footprint on the balance of the continent. So it was very exciting doing business in these cities. It saw us going to Kigali in Rwanda, saw us going to Port Louis in Mauritius, saw us going to Accra in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So a lot of really, really 
great stories, all of them focused on business. So that's Access Africa in a nutshell. <laughs> and then moving on to what is my passion at the moment, we're working in education. And the focus on education is to say, we've got this marvelous continent, we need to showcase it, we need to do more, mm. we need to get stakeholders and get partners and, and people who understand that until we do this work, we're not going to change the narrative. So that is my current passion. That is what I'm pouring all my energy into. But then mm. again, <laughs> as if that were not enough, my colleague, partner and friend, we have come together and what we're doing, Charlotte, Charlotte Kemp, her name is, mm. Charlotte Kemp and I are co-authoring a book. And that book is one of my boldest offerings to date. <laughs> oh, and I'm super excited about this one because that title sends shivers down my spine. Tell us about the book, Ilang. The book is, is very nerve wracking. And I'll tell you why it's very nerve wracking. When you title a book, Africa, on the cusp of an economic miracle, you're really going against the grain. You are really bringing questions to the fore that everybody has got to, you know, engage with and see if the data actually holds up to the claim. Mm -hmm. you know, so when, when we say Africa is on the cusp of an economic miracle, what does that mean? Well, if you take the factors that we break down in the book and juxtapose those factors against the realities on the ground, then there is a case for Africa being on the cusp of an economic miracle. Wow. If you look at the youth, right? Africa has the youngest population in the world and that's collected mm -hmm. from all the African countries. So those young people are going to have to grow. They're going to have to live. So <laughs> that in and of itself tells you that there's a lifespan there as opposed to other continents where they have dying populations, where they have yes. aging populations. Yes. And so then they have industries that cater to the decline of their, their populations, whereas Africa has a population that's on the uptake. And when mm. populations are on the uptake, then you need resources that support those populations. You need um, the technologies to support the, the populations. You need the healthcare. And, and all of these things now come into play. And the seven, seven factors that we have we are investigating to support this claim, I'm not going to talk much about that because we want you to read the book. But I uh, think we should read the book. We're, we're holding out for that one. But you can tell us the headlines. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the headlines, I'll give you three, three, three that make me very excited. So the first one I've mentioned, Africa's youngest population. Mm. The second one is technology. So oh. whilst the rest of the world um, uses technology in different ways, Africa uses technology for growth. And I'll mm. give you one case in point. So I don't know if you're aware, but in Kenya, the use of the um, PESA has more or less replaced currency, actual currency. So uh -huh. everybody in Kenya walks around with their phones and utilizes this platform, the m -Pesa. It's a virtual it's, currency, it's, basically. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a money transfer virtual currency in that it sits on the platform M-Pesa. Mm -hmm. So imagine you and I were, you know, having, there's a transaction that we would, we would do. I wouldn't give you cash or I wouldn't do any of that with, with money or currency. We would exchange on the M-Pesa. So I would send you the mm -hmm. money that way. That's fascinating because I think that is available around Africa. I think that's available here, but it hasn't taken off. Very you interesting see, it, that we take off in one environment. Yes. And, and you have to look at the reasons why it takes off in one oh. environment versus why it doesn't in another. So South Africa has a, a far more sophisticated currency transaction platform. So in South mm. Africa, we can transact in any way we choose to, whether it be the bank cards we use, whether mm. it be cash, whether mm. it be um, EFT, electronic uh, transfers. But in Kenya, that's very limited. So they all have to find something that takes away all the challenges that exist for them and mm. then utilize mm. this one thing. So hence M-Pesa. 
the platform. That's just one way that technology is being used on the continent. That's just one way. There are millions. I mean, a a lot of times money remit, for instance, where the diaspora are sending Mm -hmm. money back home, that's technology in and of itself. So you're finding creative ways of using technology to, to support the continental growth. That is fascinating. Elang, what, what this touches on is something that I'm really intrigued about in your whole approach to Africa, because uh, what you have in Kenya is then a, a less sophisticated financial system where you have fewer people who basically can bank. And so this is something that we would look at as a problem. And in comes M-Pesa, and they're able to leapfrog the technology of banking and take it a step further. And this is the kind of thing that we're hoping Africa can evoke that we have a challenge or or call, call a spade a shovel, a problem, right? We have a serious problem. Let's think of the electricity problem in South Africa at the moment. And there is an intervention that actually takes us to a point that is beyond the development that you would have in a so-called developed country. So that sets a great precedent. Absolutely. And I think the other issue that Africa faces is the fact that we're always being compared to um, the West or what would be considered developed countries. But that is inaccurate. And I'll tell you why it's inaccurate. Because you look at a country like South Africa. South Africa is neither a developing nor a developed country. It's Mm. got pockets of all of these, almost Mm. like you would, you know, it's stratified. So on each strata, you have a different experience. I've been very, very fortunate to experience South Africa's incredible wealth, where people have access to lifestyles that don't Mm. exist anywhere else in the world other than South Africa. Wow. Yes. You know, So, so what do we make of that? Mm. And and that is the reality in South Africa. Mm. But then again, you can't turn a blind eye to the gaping poverty that exists. So then you have a pyramid, a structure, a pyramid, where at the very top sits um, this this uber, uber wealth and uber success juxtaposed against this gaping poverty. So you can't really then compare. There isn't a standard for comparison. And Mm. I think when we shift from that sort of thinking, then we will view Africa, the continent, as the unique continent that it is. And this leapfrogging idea, I absolutely love it. It's it's one that, you know, many economists have even used to say Africa will be the continent of leapfrogging because Mm. so much has been done in all other continents that Africa can utilize that and make far more of themselves as a continent, as a people, as nations, through leapfrogging. That's really a heartening prospect. It really uh, creates courage and confidence and really hope in that. Not a desperate hope, but really uh, an informed hope in that economic miracle. That is the title of your book. And I understand around that book, there is a lot more coming. There are a lot of offerings surrounding this that you'll be presenting. And I wonder, Ilang, if you can share a little bit with us of... As a visionary, how these different projects and passions of you feed into each other? Because I'm sure your experiences with Access Africa around the continent has been part of every little bit of research. So by working on one project, you're actually gathering information for the next. And for a visionary, this is an incredible model to follow because it means what is a documentary at one stage becomes then content for the book, becomes content for the talks, becomes content for training and all the tremendous opportunities that you can offer people. Because as much as there is reason to hope, it's also very tempting for many people inside Africa to despair and for people outside Africa not to have the confidence to invest here. So you have been doing really groundbreaking work in that. But would you like to speak a bit to the idea of building this passion, this visionary message of yours into different offerings through your documentaries and talking and and books and so on. And and also the collaboration that you have with uh, Charlotte Kemp on this. 
because Charlotte will be a guest on the League of Visionaries podcast soon as well. So uh, definitely another episode to look out for. Absolutely. So I really appreciate how you phrased uh, the question because it makes it easy for me to break it down. So I'll use Charlotte herself as an example of how all my work feeds into the next or or the, the upcoming work. So my work is always mm-hmm. continuous, you know, so one minute we're filming for Access Africa channel, but then the very next minute I'm giving a talk about what we're doing on the continent, mm-hmm. which then allows me to meet someone like Charlotte. And when I meet someone like Charlotte, who is a visionary and a very passionate visionary at that, we have this the synergy for lack of a better word. And that synergy then translates into us sharing our views and our work and our experiences. And out of that sharing, then comes the idea to collaborate and put forward forward this book. So the beautiful thing with with the idea of the book is Charlotte is very in-depth when it comes to all the visionary work that she does. Futures, uh, 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 you know, she's very big on on imagining what the future is and embracing what is already, you know, what's in the future that's coming. So she she's quite ahead of all the upcoming trends or upcoming solutions. She's very big on artificial intelligence and how that supports growth. So when we had this conversation, the first thing she picked up on was the fact that these stories are phenomenal. She had never... She'd never heard of a lot of the things that I was telling her. And mm-hmm. she said, but, but how can this be? Because I've always wanted for there to be a different narrative, another narrative. And then I, I, I brought her onto the theory of a single story by mm-hmm. Chimamanda. And, and what Chimamanda says, Adichie, Chimamanda Adichie, what she says is there is a danger in Africa of there being a single story told. And if you notice, stories never are singular. So Mm. at the same time, if I'm to tell you a story, there are other threads in that story that make that story not a singular story. And that's, you know, what I I got Charlotte onto. And I said, well, Africa doesn't only have poverty, war and destruction and disease. It's Mm. got phenomenal success. And then I turned her eyes towards that success. And when she discovered this she said but this is a book because not enough people know this yes. and, I said, and I said well <laughs> I can't do the book alone I, the only way this book is going to happen uh because I wrote the white paper and I had to write the white paper to say you know it's it's tempting to believe that this is all there is about Africa but the facts mm state differently and when she read the white paper she was like you're lying this is a book so I said my goodness I never set out to write a book but if you and I can do it and so we you know got into that and and, and so we're writing the book together so it's it's a co co-authored effort and and Charlotte is very so whilst I tell the stories I give you the stories and what's on the ground Charlotte then takes that and puts empirical numbers behind it and, oh. and, and yeah it's because at the end of the day for credibility to be had it's one thing to have a story but you need uh, the research and the data that speaks to it you know yes. that-, uh, that is exactly one of the important things a visionary needs to know People respond to different kinds of things. We have our right brainers, our more emotionally driven people who respond to the story. And we have our facts people, our left brainers who respond to the logic, the logos of how we reach people. So that is solid gold for visionaries. Also the idea of collaboration, right? And I love the fact that you two are are collaborating to each bring your strength and genius to the project. No, absolutely. And and I think collaboration is an underlooked uh, method of of getting work done. You know, one of the first things that Peter McClary, the then CEO at Tiger Brands told me back Mm -hmm. in the day when we were commissioned to tell the Tiger Brands story, the theme, the central theme of Tiger Brands expansion was collaboration. 
Yeah. You know, and, and I think working on that project was solid gold for me because it taught me really early on that you're going to do far better when you collaborate with others. You're going wow. to do so much more when you are open to sharing and bringing what you have and the others bringing what they have. And, and that, in a sense, is, is something that Africa is, is really great at. We are great at collaborating because we understand. Mm -hmm. We understand that for the, for the challenges that the continent's experiencing to, you know, to, to evolve and, 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 and change, we've got mm -hmm. to collaborate. That is so powerful. And what a great credit to an organization, a, a big corporate, really, that is feeding the continent to actually say that their corporate culture almost infected you with uh, with this spirit of collaboration. And the name we use for it is is Ubuntu, right? It, it just really is that spirit of um, a person is a person through other people. We collaborate, we're stronger together. And there is power in that, that we can never have on our own. What what a powerful experience to have, Ilang. Thank you for sharing that. I have a usual question that I ask, and I never really get round to it, because the visionaries that I interview, like you, Ilang, very often have such a diverse experience and such a diverse spectrum of things that they do that I never quite know how to ask this. My question is, what is the typical work that you do? But let's let's snapshot it like this. What is a day in the life or an ideal day in, in your life of uh, work as a visionary with your message of Africa being on the cusp of an economic miracle? <laughs> so to answer that question, I have to dispel anybody listening of there being any glamour to this there is no glamour whatsoever it is grueling excruciatingly hard work um and the reason i say it is grueling excruciatingly hard work is because time is a big problem in africa you know to get things done on time and you're always negotiating with time and you're always trying to make sure that things get done on time and everything you do revolves around time add to that you know, i'm sure it's different here like I, for anybody listening from another continent well, like i can verify it is absolutely different <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. there's a reason we, we call it Africa time <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no we're famous so that is that is one thing that I don't even try and dispel because it's really <laughs> it would be pure madness folly at its best um so so you are very you're always chasing time but here's the beautiful thing about that you then learn how to manage time because it becomes such a precious resource mm. so what what I find my my typical day looks like is the day before the day starts. I always have um, an idea of who I need to speak to, what I need to focus on, and then I break down all the various roles and everything that I'm doing into blocks. Right there, we go again with the time thing. I break it down into blocks, and I'm like, okay, then I've got to do this, and the book is here, the documentary is here. Um, the TV show is there. The, so in one day, 24 hours are never enough. Never. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes. This, this is an ongoing challenge because there are just so many things that, that deserve to be done, isn't it? And, and you have set yourself a great task. As you say, it's a calling because there is that element of visionary work is grueling and yet you keep going. What is the purpose that drives you on? You have to keep going and I'll tell you why you have to keep going. Most visionaries do the, the, the unspeakable and they, they share their visions quite you know, loudly and, and, and proudly and say, this is my crusade. I'm going on this crusade. I'm going to do this and that and the other. Prepare <laughs> to be tested. <laughs> exactly. So, so once you've set that tone for your life, then you need to live up to it, don't you? You need to fulfill mm -hmm. it. You need to be able to look back and say, all right, then I set out to do X, Y, and Z. And I said, I would do one, two, three. Have I done it? Um, and, and for me, I think the love of the continent keeps me going. 
I have an inexplicable love for Africa. I, I love everything about this continent. I love its geography. I love its people. I love the smell of Africa. I love, I could not see myself being anything other than African and living anywhere other than Africa. So when a continent is so etched in your soul and your spirit and everything you do, then you, you have to find ways for that to be your life's work, you know, mm -hmm. so that you're able to stay with it, stay with, with that which you love. I love the continent. So if I'm creating content, it's content for the continent. I'm not interested in making anything other than content for Africa. And that's just because of how much I love Africa. So if I'm going to tell a story, Africa will be the focus of my story. If I'm going to read a book, write a book, uh, watch documentaries, it's always going to be about Africa. And I think that's what, that, that's what keeps me happy. You know, it keeps me happy mm -hmm. to discover things about the continent. Uh, like the one time I was having conversations with my friends and they said, oh, the next holiday, they want to go to, well, I think it was Bali or whatever. <laughs> and then said, I said, why are you going to Bali when we've got the most beautiful beaches? And, and, and. and so they said to me, well, show us one and don't bring Cape Town into it. So I said, okay, fine. I won't bring Cape Town into it. Mm -hmm. And I said, Malawi, have you been mm -hmm. to Kwichi Kwichi Lake in Lake Malawi? Uh -huh. And that allowed me to show them these spectacular, I tell you, the beauty on this continent is breathtaking, mm -hmm. you know? And so in that moment, I changed perspectives. I said, you know, why are you taking resources that we can very well utilize on this continent, see the continent, travel the continent. And that is why we need that message out there, because nobody is telling this story of the beautiful beaches, the beautiful jungles, the beautiful mountains where you can actually go in Africa as someone who's already here. Uh, and interestingly enough, very often those stories do go to Europe. So it's it's fascinating to see how people from outside the country love to visit this country. And I'm also intrigued as you speak of these pockets of extreme wealth. I wonder how many people in Africa realize how many semi-settlers we have from other countries who are living a very luxurious lifestyle here because it would be really difficult to have that kind of standard of living in other places. But it needs to be in a pocket because uh, there is so much, there are so many challenges outside of that. So this is fascinating and getting the word out it makes all the difference. No, absolutely, absolutely. I was speaking to a friend of mine who uh, works for the UN and we were having this conversation about a part of DRC that is, it will put Switzerland to shame. In its really? Country. Yes. And I said to him, I've heard about this place. And he says to me, well, you've only heard about it. I've been. And I oh. said, it's true, it's true. <laughs> and he said to me, it is very true. It is very true. But to access it, you've got to go through, you know, where all the rebels and, and all the <gasps> infighting and all of that that's happening. But once you get through, and obviously because he works for the UN, so then they get on their UN. Uh, their helicopters and things. Or mm. However they, <laughs> all of mm. you know that. And, and so he's seen it and I said to him, because I, I saw a clips of it on TikTok. And I said, this mm. cannot be. It cannot be for a place to be this breathtakingly beautiful. And he said to me, it is. That's what's on this continent. That's what's here. But I mean, you and I who even have access don't know about this. Right. You know? So there's the knowledge and then there is the, the test to cross, you know, the, the possibility who would put their safety at risk to, uh, to pass. If you're not in an armored vehicle, people might be cautious. And when these stories get out, the question always is, would it be possible to create enough of a trickle down of wealth that people who are fighting might have different interests? You know, if, if there's more justice, if there's more opportunity, what would that do to things like 
violence, underdevelopment, crime, and and problems like this. And, and these are some of the difficult realities that people are likely to confront you with when you share your vision. How do you approach and break through their barriers? Because uh, you you have got a lot of, call it ammunition. You've got your stories, right? You've got your experiences. You've got your data showing us that there are these pockets of hope, that there is all this potential. What is your approach to the naysayers? Brilliant question once again. I think naysayers will always be naysayers. There is a point. <laughs> yeah, there, there'll always be naysayers. There, 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 there isn't enough in the world to convince a naysayer who has set their minds to believing, you know, the negative. There, mm. there aren't enough stories. There isn't enough experience. There aren't enough. Uh, there's nothing that you can do to sway a naysayer. Mm. However, my focus is never on the naysayers because if, mm-hmm. if that had been the case, I would have become despondent. I would have seen it in, in, in through their lens and mm. I would have given up. So that's mm. not who I'm interested in. Who mm. I'm interested in are others like me, the visionaries, the dreamers, the mm. youth, the people mm. who have something to live for and who need to believe this message, that's the audience, you know, Mm -hmm. because they are the ones who, when they hear the stories, will have an interest in making their dreams come true. But then the stories will be their ammunition. They'll look to people, young people on the continent who against all odds have made it happen. And they will see that inspiration and that inspiration will encourage them to do more, to be more and to give more to the continent. So those are the people that I hope this book speaks to. And for the naysayers, look, there's always a balance in life and Mm. the naysayers exist for a reason. And so I think they're going to carry on believing that the continent is doomed. They're going to carry on thinking, you know, negatively about Africa. Mm. But we have to do what we have to do. Mm. That's a very courageous stance. Now, the, the audience that you say is open is the youth. And it's really fascinating that many, maybe many of the naysayers were just conditioned with the old narrative because there wasn't an alternative narrative like the one that you offer now. It is a great possibility that the youth in Africa today can hear narratives like the one that you share with Access Africa Channel and through your work and through your book, that this is what they hear Africa is. Because we don't believe, none of us ever believe that we believe in opinion. We believe that we believe the truth, right? (laughs) The way I see it is the truth. That's not negotiable. And if their embedded truth, their ingrained truth is that Africa is a continent of possibilities, that is really a a tremendously effective way to start to make that economic miracle happen. Would you like to tell us more about your view and your vision for education within Africa and why this is so important? So I... I think education is at the heart of all the challenges we have and not necessarily the traditional form of education, but again, leapfrogging. So when you look at how technology has impacted education on the African continent, then you begin to get very hopeful. You start to see that when these kids, and I refer to kids, you know, an age group from Uh, early childhood development right through to your universities, when you see how these kids embrace technology, Mm. that's hopeful. And that technology is giving them education that we didn't have. I mean, when I grew up, we the idea of a computer was so far-fetched, it didn't even exist, right? Mm. But now these kids have got access to the whole world through devices such as their phones, through devices such as laptops. And these technologies are being brought in Africa to 
um, even grassroots uh, 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 education uh, systems. So you, you find in villages where laptops are brought through and these kids now can see the world mm -hmm. through the wor wi world wide web, right? Mm -hmm. so, so when you look at education through that lens and you see that, okay, education coupled with technology arms these children, these youth, with so much more than we ever had. It teaches them so much more than we ever had. It opens up their minds and their worlds. I mean, 4IR is a reality. Whether you like mm -hmm. it or not, it is a reality. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I use a, a very simple example. My daughter found me working. She's, she's 11 years old. And she found me testing chat GPT. And the first <laughs> thing she, she said- always, always an interesting parenting conversation nowadays. So she says to me, as she's seeing me input what I needed to input, she says to me, Mommy, can Chat GPT do my homework for me? Ah. I thought, I thought to myself, how did you connect the dots? Why is that the thing that you would want Chat GPT to do for you? <laughs> right? Right? So you think on it. 11 years old, introduced to the idea of artificial intelligence and the first thing is can this do my homework for me it tells mm -hmm. you where the youth are at it tells you that they have so the, the homework for her is her challenge that's her challenge I'm not interested mm -hmm. in this homework can mm -hmm. this technology do it for me mm -hmm. so once they start thinking like that that's what we harness we harness the fact that they can be solutions driven we harness the fact that they see technology as something that solves their problems because that is now how they use those problem solving skills in collaboration with artificial intelligence and a whole new world emerges. We never had that. Yes. Yes, it's really fascinating how the kids go, can chat GPT do my homework or can artificial intelligence do my homework for me? And the adults are going, can artificial intelligence take my job? And that is a very interesting intersection, right? Because there are elements of your homework that no AI can do. And if you equip yourself to do your work in a way that no artificial intelligence can take it over when you can have the wisdom, when you can have the creativity, when you can have the innovation that is not possible for an algorithm to do, then you have security. And I think where the, the world of work, as we look at this, the youth of Africa entering a time when they will want to be economically productive, things are going to change a lot. And it would be fascinating to see. It might not be work that creates the income for our next generation. It may be pure innovation. Absolutely. I think you and I are in full agreement there because we are so beholden to this idea of work, you know, and that's a generational thing. That is the world that we lived in. That is the world that we, we, we come from. We, we were made in that world. Mm -hmm. So to ask us to understand it differently is, is a huge challenge, even for a visionary, because it's what you know. It's, it's what you've been. But mm -hmm. these kids... That's not their reality. I mean, they were born into cell phones for crying out loud. They were mm -hmm. born having that technology at the, and, and you know how we evolve as human beings. Once the technology exists and we are born into it, then it's almost symbiotic. It's not almost, it is symbiotic, yes. right? And so you have this symbiosis where the children and the youth uh, understanding the power of technology and understanding their lives, then they're able to chart a whole new course for themselves. So much is possible. And that's the youth. You have another passion, and that is women across Africa. So women are, are dear to my heart because women are powerful beyond belief. Um, and this is global. It's not just Africa, you know. Um, we are a gender that is, is I, I honestly believe God would have to be a woman to achieve what God achieves. There's no way he can be a man. Well, oh, okay. The, the bits that go right. The bits that go right, definitely. <laughs> the bits that go right. There you go. But, but the reason I say this is that 
women are so resourceful and resilient Mm. and there is nothing that gets a woman down nothing at all and women also understand how important it is to bring everybody to the table Mm. women understand that I, i believe it's because women birth so if you birth um you understand that which you have birthed and and if we have a group of people who birth then that group of people understand that what i have birthed has has got to have a place you know so then we become responsible and i think because women are so responsible we are responsible for what happens. We're responsible for how it happens. And also women know how to manage ego. So mm-hmm. you'll find that women will come together for a common good and realize that I might have to do this and never get the credit, but yeah. they'll do it anyway. They'll do it anyway because they are women. Because So when you get the right women doing the right things mm. it's just unbelievable what 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 gets done i mean look at look at the prime minister of new zealand look at that 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 was a global first right mm. to have mm. had power to have done your absolute best and then to have gotten to a point where you say i have to step away mm. that doesn't mm. happen it it takes women to do that Look at African women. Look at African women who, in South Africa, case in point, these women uh, have have jobs, low paid paying jobs, um, mm. um, minimum minimum wage earning jobs, like you know whether you're cleaners, your shop assistants, or whatever. But they go on to put children through education with mm. the pittance that they earn, and you mm. cannot tell me that that doesn't come from a superpower it does it has to Mm -hmm. because you and I know what it is to try and survive on you know we don't have minimal wage earning uh, uh, careers and even then it's challenging so what more someone who has that but they are so resourceful they're selling anything and everything where they can they are you know, creating innovations in their homes that allow for them to work and raise children. So Mm. I'm I'm passionate about women because when you empower women, oh my goodness, when you empower women, if if that was the only thing we set out to do is empower women on this continent and, and, and that's it, we did nothing else. We would have, we would have won the battle half the battle would be won because then, you know, obviously you'd have to resource and bring in the resources, but the empowerment of women, so important. The Mm. supporting of women, providing them with loans. I mean, there there are studies that were done by the AFDB, African Development Bank, where they said, they looked at the loan structure, how they give out uh, micro loans to these um, uh, women. They said, wait for it, 100% of the women always repaid the loans. Oh, well, that that is a big confidence builder, right? Because what happens when you repay one loan, you get the opportunity for a bigger one. And if if you're able to repay the loan and make a profit on it, start to build something bigger, that's a growing economy. That is absolutely incredible. And so that then encourages all the lending instruments to to be women focused in Africa, you know, Mm. for them to see that, you know, it's best to provide the funding for women and to women, women in agriculture right now, they're a big one, you know, looking at because food security is one of our next challenges. Well, it's always been, but it's one of the next challenges, especially with all the global warming and all the challenges that we have on you know, the ESG front. But when you empower women and you say, even if it's a small holding, even if it's just a patch of dirt, anything, mm-hmm. and you give them the empowerment and, and the support, mm-hmm. it never goes to waste. Mm-hmm. They will work as hard as they possibly can because they know their families are tied 
to the success of this endeavor. And there's something about that is that is really about caring, this deep, deep caring. And this is something that's echoed in your visionary message in the work that you do. So that's just a, a beautiful, uh, almost a close to our discussion because I see we're about to run out of time. But Elang, before we wrap up, because this conversation has got a lot of places to go, so I can't wait till we can meet up again. But uh, I'd love to ask you your ultimate ideal. If you had a magic wand to wave, what would the world look like? Oh, what would the world look like? I think the world would look like the place it was always meant to look like. It would look like humanity operating for its highest good. It would mm. look like security for all. It would look like love, you know? people loving each other, people loving nature, people just just a big global love, you know, mm. and love of love of neighbor, love of family, love of each other, mm. you know, and it would it would be peaceful. It would we wouldn't and we wouldn't have the terror that we have now. And we wouldn't have the the fear that we have now. I would want a fearless world. I would want a joyful world. I would want a world where, you know, our children are so excited to belong to this world and to live in this world. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's possible. I mean, you and I won't see it. You and I won't see it. But if we do what we need to do now, if we stay true to the course that we've you know, been put on and do our bit and others do their bit. I believe that this world indeed can be glorious. Wow. And let's keep planting the seeds in Africa as you do. Elang, where can people find you? The best place to go and track you down with your wonderful channel. And of course, on LinkedIn is uh, one of the good places. Tell us more. Where should we go? So you can go to LinkedIn, as you said. We've got a Facebook page. It's Access Africa Channel. We've got a website. That's uh, www.accessafricachannel.tv. Um, we've got uh, Instagram as well. Absolutely fantastic. Wonderful. I am going to also add that in our description so that they're easy and right there and clickable because this is a cause worth following. Uh, your narrative for Africa is one that we truly, truly do need. Elang Prajinka of Access Africa Channel and Africa on the cusp of an economic miracle. We're looking out for the book. We're looking out for the next series and looking out for your visionary work. Thank you so much for being with us today. The pleasure has been mine. I thank you and I thank all other members of the League of Visionaries. We are many and let's carry on doing what we've been called to do. Absolutely. You've been listening to the League of Visionaries podcast by Yazi Media, proudly brought to you by Totally Morpheus. Subscribe to the League of Visionaries podcast here on your favorite podcasting platform and follow Yazi Media on LinkedIn to find out more about how you can share your visionary message with the world. If you are a visionary, chances are you are also a leader. But what is your current leadership state? The way you are leading right now, your default setting, if you will. The Egg 3 Leadership Assessment helps you to understand the way you lead, your strengths, and your potential challenges as a leader. And most importantly, how to create your unique leadership legacy. It's fast. It's fun. It's free. It's the Egg 3 Leadership Assessment from Totally Morpheus. And when you take this assessment, you will get an instant report right away pointing the way to your living leadership legacy. Find the Egg 3 Leadership Assessment now at totallymorpheus.com.